I'm Mark Golub, and for election 2016, all eyes are now turned toward the state of New York in both party primaries. Very often, New York has been irrelevant, not this year, and questions abound on the Democratic side and the Republican side. On the Democratic side, can Bernie Sanders continue his win streak and upset Hillary Clinton in her home state? And if he does, is there then a ghost of a chance that Bernie Sanders could keep Hillary Clinton from reaching the magic number of delegates needed for her to win the nomination? While on the Republican side, can Ted Cruz follow his upset victory in Wisconsin with another upset victory over Donald Trump in Trump's home state of New York, which would most likely mean that Donald Trump will fall short of the majority of delegates he needs before Cleveland to avoid an open Republican convention in July where it seems more and more certain that the Republican establishment will coalesce to prevent Trump from becoming their nominee. Let's take a quick look at where things stand now after Wisconsin. On the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders won his sixth primary in a row defeating Hillary by some 14 points. Clinton got murdered by Sanders among young voters, and she still has a huge problem of trust, and political commentators are pointing out that Hillary has not been able to put Sanders away, even though he is a 73-year-old socialist. The number of primaries each has won is fairly close, as you can see on the screen, 20 to 16, and yet it's all about the delegate count. And despite Sanders' victory last night, he only picked up three delegates on Hillary Clinton. And in the overall delegate count, Hillary leads by more than 600 delegates and is more than 200 Superdelegates pledged to her. And I apologize. I want to go back to the slide we just missed. It was my fault. Show the slide before that if you can. Yes, what's interesting here is, again, Sanders wins by 14 points, but on the delegate count, he only gains a net of three over Hillary. And that's Sanders' problem. So it looks like Hillary Clinton will be the nominee while Bernie Sanders seems to be having all the fun, especially when he's winning. It's always fun when you're winning. And speaking of fun, Bernie is planning a rally next week in Manhattan's Union Square, where it's estimated that as many as 20,000 supporters will be there feeling the burn. It's just a fun time in politics today. If you're a, if you're a political junkie, this is just fun. Fun. On the Republican side, it's not that simple. After Wisconsin, it's not clear who will be the Republican nominee. Ted Cruz won a stunning upset victory with almost 50% of the vote and garnering almost all of Wisconsin's 42 delegates. And while Donald Trump still leads in the delegate count, you can see the lead is dwindling. And more important, it is now highly unlikely that Trump can win the 1,237 delegates needed for him to gain the nomination before the Republican convention in Cleveland this July. It also seems as if the Republican establishment will again not let Donald Trump be nominated in an open convention. And then it's anybody's guess as to who will become the Republican presidential nominee. That's the picture. And against this backdrop, how does the Jewish community view the current political landscape? For some insight, I'm so pleased to have back on our JBS phones the outstanding Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, Ron Campius. Ron, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. By the way, are you having fun? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I mean, this is you know, interesting for sure. <laughs> absolutely. You're, but you're in Washington. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. All of the 
the candidates are all over the country. You're in Washington, but you are around the political center of America. So I'm hoping it's still some fun for you, even though, Ron, isn't this one of the wackiest presidential election seasons you've ever seen? It's amazing, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, completely unpredictable. Uh, you know, I think that the um, there's been reports in, in recent, uh, in the last week or so, on both sides, that both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump did not anticipate winning. They did not anticipate uh, being this close to the presidency. And to Donald Trump, of course, is actually winning, and Sanders isn't winning, but he didn't anticipate being this close. Both, uh, both there have been reports that saying at the outset, or at least before they launched, they formally launched the campaign, each man said they, they wanted to influence their party. They didn't anticipate winning, and here we are. Here we are. So, Ron, what are you hearing from Jewish Democrats about Bernie Sanders' run at Hillary Clinton? I think, that, you know, the uh, Jewish Democrats, uh, well, first of all, in terms of the popular vote, there was finally, there was, there's been some um, some actual polling going on, and uh, Gallup um, showed approval ratings that they're virtually tied at 60%, uh, 60 to 61, Hillary Clinton and and um, and Bernie Sanders. In the and, Jewish which, community. Yeah, yeah. And of course, approval, it's not the same as saying who would you vote for in, a, in a, an election, but it's interesting that they're both equally... Um, uh, they're both equally liked. That's I, fascinating to me. Do they break it down by age group by any chance? That I didn't see. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't look. Uh, aren't well, aren't you surprised? Putting those out. Yeah. Aren't you surprised that Sanders would have the same number as Clinton in the Jewish community? Uh, you know, I think it's just what's happening with Democrats. He was trailing Hillary nationally until recently, and now there, he's got a slight lead on her, according to the. Uh, the the later polls. I mean, you know, winning is its own, you know, it's 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 it's, a, it's its own argument, right? Yes. So he won yes. the last six contests, even though he's trailing in del the delegates, he becomes and he he gets seen as as uh, as more viable. Okay. Um, how do you think Clinton will do in New York? They're arguing it is no longer a guaranteed win for her. Uh, yeah, I think that there are there. I've, I've also heard that. Um, not so much that it's no longer a guaranteed win, it's no longer a guaranteed trouncing. In other words, the anticipation is that she will win, but that it might not be as uh, by as much as, uh, as she had anticipated. Look, all five candidates that remain in both parties are going to focus heavily on New York. And just as you said a few minutes ago, New York, for the first time in I don't know how long and how right. many decades, has become relevant, not just in one party, but in both parties. Yes. It's, uh, it's must... Uh, it's must win or must perform well for both uh, for both candidates. And um, you know, Sanders is going to play up his Brooklyn roots. Yes, he's going to, he's going to speak to uh, uh, he, he's going to go out and try and speak to uh, to younger people, but also appeal to minorities. Uh, and and Clinton is still is doing better among minorities. You know, where did she win last night in Wisconsin? She won in Milwaukee, um, which is. Uh, which is a is a more diverse city than the certainly the rest of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the state is, and she continues to win uh, 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 among minorities, and that's uh, that's Sanders' main challenge to try and uh, uh, and get through to uh, to the minorities. And New York is a diverse state. I don't know if he's going to be able uh, to do it there. There will be pockets that will be enormously enthusiastic for him, but the state as a whole, you describe it very well. It will be interesting. Come back for one more moment to this fact that it looks like Jewish Democrats are split fairly evenly between Hillary and Bernie. Uh, do Jewish Democrats have an understanding, or does it matter to them, where the two candidates stand on Israel? I mean, we've discussed this before, you and I, that there are two issues that drive Jewish voting patterns. One is a a real concern for the social well-being, domestic issues, and social action in, in some way energizes a great percentage of American Jewry. And then there are American Jews who are energized and who are driven by their concern for Israel. Very often that it's not the same people. But I'm asking you if you have any sense of where Jewish Democrats stand on Israel and domestic policy as it applies to Bernie and Hillary. 
Look, in terms of like actual voters, I think uh, the it looks like they're not. It, it's not the foremost issue in their minds. When, Which is not. Yeah, Israel. Israel uh, is okay. not the foremost issue in their minds. Right. Like, but as we've spoken about in the past, uh, the you know the whole Israel issue works in um, in kind of concentric circles. The closer you get to the organized Jewish community, to people who are more likely to be involved, people who are who attend shul regularly in one way or another, the more that Israel is likely to rise as an issue. And I think then then the more concerning uh, Sanders, uh, some of Sanders' views become. Uh, and it's not even like um, a colleague, Ir yeah, Rosenberg in Tablet just wrote, it's like is the mistake he made in the, um, uh, in the Daily News when he talked about, you know, he asked, is it 10,000 people, 10,000 civilians that killed? Israel killed in Gaza? No, it's probably, it's between 600 and 1,200, depending on yes. which side you <laughs> yes. believe in terms of the 2014 war. But the problem there, the way he put it, the way he kept on asking the question, it's not so much that he uh, tends to be anti-Israel. I don't think he does tend to be anti-Israel. But it's that he doesn't really seem to know a lot about the topic, despite mm -hmm. having lived there, despite uh, having um, family there, as he, uh, as he noted. It's not his, mo it's not his most important priority now. And I think that in that that concerns traditional pro-Israel Democrats who are, have been heavily involved in the party and heavily involved in Israel issues. I mean, if you look at, you know, people that I speak to, the, the people who have been liberal Democrats, major donors to both pro-Israel causes and to uh, democratic and uh, social justice causes, I see more support for, uh, for Hillary Clinton in that bunch that oh. I, I certainly do see for Bernie. Okay, then where does the Jewish support for uh, Bernie emanate from? It, it, comes, it comes from the same place it's coming from in general. It comes from, from young Jews, I think, a lot of young Jews, but Jews who aren't, who aren't looking for, um, for Israel as their number one issue. I mean, I think we've talked about this yes, in but the you, past. Excuse me, you just said that when it comes to social issues, Hillary is the one Jews tend to gravitate to, to I more. I mean, the people who, who are both concerned about Israel, who are deeply involved in Israel issues and in social ah, issues, they're I going see. for Hillary. That's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and no, but Bernie's get, definitely getting people who are in, interested in social issues. I think what's interesting is for Jewish Democrats, at least, the famous threshold. Like, uh, can we back a candidate for uh, president? He has. It doesn't have to be the best of the candidates on Israel, but he has to meet a meet a certain threshold. Yes. And, and we saw that with Barack Obama for Jewish Democrats over the last few years. And what's interesting, maybe among Jewish millennials, among younger Jews, Bernie Sanders meets that threshold. He's not... Very interesting. He's not I don't, a Zionist. He's lived in Israel. He has affection for Israel. But he certainly doesn't look like your pro-Israel politician of yore. Exactly. And again, I'm referring to some conversations we've had over the last number of weeks, even months. And... My sense is that the young people who are very enthusiastic for Bernie Sanders, for them Israel is not a primary concern. I don't really feel that Israel has been a topic of main concern to any of the candidates and that you almost have to dig to find out what each candidate feels about or where they stand on Israel. And all I know about Bernie Sanders is he said, he was, he asked, was asked the question, where does he get his information? And his answer was J Street. And then you gave an example of, of you know, his lack of understanding. At the same time, Ron, it doesn't seem to matter to people who support him. And the only thing that surprises me about what you're telling me is that there are as many people in the Jewish community who feel strongly about Bernie Sanders as there are Jews who feel strongly about Hillary Clinton. And that is what you're saying, correct? Yeah, yeah. Look, like I said, the, there's, uh, there's two different questions you can ask. You can ask who you're going to vote for for president. That might have produced a different number. But who do you approve of? Uh -huh. Both get 60 and 61 percent. It's equal. They, get, they both have high approval among Jewish, uh, Jewish voters. Absolutely. It's, it's extraordinary, I think. Okay. Uh, and, you know, it shows, I think, the degree. I think that, you know, if you'd asked this poll question six, ten months ago, uh, Bernie would have scored much lower, but that would have simply been because not many people knew who he was or aware, was aware of him. Well, Jewish it, 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 become it, aware of him, and they like it. Yes, it is a phenomenon. By the way, it's not fair to expect you to know the answer. 
but I just want your feeling at the moment. You know, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being an absolute certainty, what do you think the probability is that Hillary Clinton will still win the Democratic nomination? I think it's about 8 or 9. I agree. Sorry. I agree. Okay. So how do Jewish Republicans feel these days? I see, you know, how do they feel about Donald Trump, as far as you can tell? You know, there are still concerns. He had a very good reception at the APAC uh, policy conference. Wasn't that remarkable, Ron? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, and the thing is, he, like, I was there, and he's a very good speaker. He's very entertaining. He knows what to say. Uh, and then there is that sort of weird thing the next day where APAC denounced him. What did you think of that? Uh, you know, but wait, it, we'll, let make, we'll make sure the audience knows what you're referring to. At one point in his speech, Donald Trump refers to the fact that it's, Donald, it's um, Barack Obama's last year, and he goes, yay, yay. and the room gives him a standing ovation. By the way, Ron, I've talked to Jews who would never vote for Trump in a million years. They got up and cheered when he said that because there is, in that room, there was so much anti, it, it, not about it's not about him personally, but they feel the Obama administration has permitted this daylight to occur between the U.S. and Israel. And there are a lot of people who want this administration to come to an end. But you were in the room. Do you remember that moment? And what did you experience? Well, you know, they had us, APAC, APAC had us six stories up. It's a, uh, yes, it's a basketball right. hockey <laughs> stadium. So we were in the sports booth. Yes. But yeah, it was, uh, you could see, you could sense like the, the laughter and then he followed up by saying, worst thing that ever happened to Israel. And I, you know, I asked APAC, what exactly were they condemning? Can you just explain it to me? I didn't, they wouldn't give me an answer. Good for you. <laughs> but but uh, I have a feeling perhaps it was the second thing he said. The, not the yay so much, but the worst thing. And it's, it's sort of interesting, the gap between the way somebody sort of casually speaks. And Trump is somebody who's gotten where he does because he's like a straight speaker. He exactly. doesn't necessarily guard his words. If exactly. they said worst president for Israel, even though I think that that's objectively a difficult case to make, I don't think that AIPAC would have objected. Worst thing that happened to Israel, again, he's, on the one side, he's speaking casually. On the other side, if you're an AIPAC person, you're thinking, what, Yom Kippur War? You know, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that have happened to Israel that are a little worse than Barack Obama. Yes. Um, and so it's a, uh, so I think that that's a part of it. On the other hand, that kind of hyperbole isn't that unusual. And I think that the APAC statement the next day reflects uh, concerns about Trump with the donor class. You know, the immediate, I got like an old Jewish hand who I won't name. I was typing up my story. They threw us out of the, uh, they threw us out of the Verizon Center because the, the Israeli rock concert they had afterwards was quote unquote off the record. That's what I'll never <laughs> figure out. Yes. <laughs> so I crossed the street to the, to the Starbucks. I started writing my story and I got a call from an old Jewish community hand. And he said to me, did you notice the one thing he didn't mention, Ron? And nobody had noticed this. And I said, what? He said, every other, this guy said, every other candidate mentioned defense assistance to Israel, renewing the me memorandum of understanding. It's the one thing that, um, that Trump, uh, Trump, left Trump out. did not mention. Yes. And, um, and that is like more than anything else, even more than the Iran deal. That is the pro-Israel APAC bread and butter. And so here's a guy whose overall rhetoric has to do with um, cutting assistance overseas, who said when he was asked, and you know, so much of what Donald Trump says that gets him into trouble is, the, is when he's actually asked a kind of ignorant question. And so, so when he was, he said at a press conference earlier that very day, when, when somebody said, you say you're gonna cut uh, defense assistance to Korea and to Japan, you're gonna make them pay. Are you gonna make Israel pay? And he said, yes, yes. And it's completely different arrangements, of course. You've got American troops in Japan and Korea. You don't. The whole point of Israel is that you're that you the the bang for your buck you get from defense assistance for Israel is you don't have to position American troops to that great an extent in the Middle East. But he said yes, and so he got that at his press conference earlier the same day. Failure to mention the MOU. You've got to wonder is this is with this president is defense assistance. Uh, under question, and I think that that's creating a lot of nervousness. Some of I, I, but I think that's a very sophisticated analysis on your part, Yasha Koch. You know, there are many reasons, it seems to me, that one can be legitimately worried that Donald Trump is not equipped to be president of the United States. 
And if one wants to make those arguments, I am very sympathetic whether I agree with every one of them or not. I, I believe that they are all legitimate and substantive. I, found, I find that the ad hominem comments about him, he's a racist, he's a bigot, he's a demagogue, that they are unfair and that they don't really describe a, a man who has captured the imagination of so many Americans because, as, first of all, as you say, he just says it the way so many people think. And, it, and it's not only that he, he doesn't seem to care about being politically correct, it's that we're used to politicians speaking in doublespeak all the time, and we're sick and tired of it. And here comes a guy who sometimes says something isn't the, you know, the smartest thing ever to be said, but when he's talking, it's what you said, at APEC, he's just talking to us, you know? And my own feeling is that you've described what really gets him in trouble. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that there's, you know, there's a certain nuance to it as well. He speaks his mind. He doesn't necessarily speak the truth. <laughs> you know, he, say, he speaks, he says what he thinks he knows. I mean, there's a reason we talk about the difficulty, you know, and I, I, more than any, anybody else, reporters have an issue with trying to get politicians to just say something straight out. But on the other hand, the reason that they're, they're being considered is because when they speak and they're being careful when, they're, when they speak is that so often the things that you want to say plainly aren't necessarily the truth, you know? Yes, so he yes. could, like I said, you know, and so he, you see him being reactive. Uh, you, if you, you see him saying, you know, when he's being pressed on whether the woman should be punished for an abortion, he said, oh yeah, yeah, she should be punished for abortion because it's the first thing that comes into his mind. And then he gets slammed from the left to the right the next day because there's just, there's just no real constituency, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life uh, in the United States, that says women should be um, punished. So yeah, he's speaking his mind. The question is whether it's of any use to anybody in that particular All case. right, all right. By the way, give him credit for speaking his mind and say what he says is nonsense. That's the reason to be against him if one is against him. Incidentally, forgive me for this digression. You understand that what Donald Trump said about conservatives or people who are anti-abortion wanting to punish women, Ron, do you doubt for one moment that if in this country what is already unthinkable, the unthinkable would happen, that abortion would become illegal? That is unthinkable. But Ron, if this nation ultimately voted and decided as a nation we should be again we should forbid abortion it would be because too many people now would see abortion as murder and if this country ever moved that far to the right i do not doubt for one second that the people who are anti-abortion would say if a woman doesn't obey the law there should be some kind of punishment for her and that's all donald trump said i believe he said it absolutely correctly, and that anybody on the right who is against abortion is being, at best, disingenuous, and at worst, a liar, if they say they don't agree with Donald Trump. What's your sense? You know, I think that the, that could be what it evolves into. I think that the, a lot of the, I mean, look, what's one of the, na the name of one of the, um, of the main, um, anti-abortion groups. This is in the Anthony group. They're named for one of the premier American feminists because at one time when women were, uh, when men held real control over women's bodies, it wasn't a matter of just make it, men making women baby factories. It was also a matter of men forcing women to have abortions. So they come out of a tradition of women having choice. A lot of this ideology comes out of that tradition. And I think that there is this genuine like, shock that anybody would consider that they at least for that section of the anti-abortion movement, that they would consider women as deserving as of uh, of of punishment. It's a uh, it's it's a view. I mean, there's like it's but there's an interesting you know opposing ideological factions between it in a given country sometimes mirror each mirror each other. So maybe a hundred years ago, somebody who was anti-abortion would have seen the woman as being sinful. With the influence of feminism, even on its opponents, even on the people who don't like feminism, with the influence of feminism, you have conservatives being much more 
uh, posturing themselves as being the true defenders of, uh, of women's rights. I, I mean, understand. Look at, look at Ted Cruz's speech last night where he talks about the importance of, very, of, uh, of strong women. He's a very staunch conservative. I don't doubt that he believes it, that there is an I, but wait, I agree with you, and I don't believe that Trump or Cruz is necessarily anti-woman. We disagree, however, on whether, again, in the unlikely situation, the almost unfathomable situation, that abortion would become illegal in this country. I believe that there would be many people who would say, yes, a woman who breaks the law is also likely to, in some way, should be punished. I only have a few moments left with you. Tell me what the Jewish community is saying about Ted Cruz, who, according to many inside Republicans, is loathed by the Republican establishment. What do you hear about uh, from um, you know, Jewish Republicans they're feeling about Ted Cruz? I think there's a gravitation kind of towards him because just by comparison with Donald Trump on, on certain issues, um, whether it's a foreign policy, which is, of course, a huge issue for Jewish Republicans, uh, Ted Cruz is unquestionably dedicated to um, the defense of Israel. Uh, you know, and if they want to, like, uh, if, if they don't like him for the broader foreign policy questions, as many neoconservatives don't like Ted Cruz, they're prepared to say at least, you know, the bottom line is that we know where he is on Israel, on Iran, on other issues. Uh, you know, just that that he's a uh, he's a predictable politician. He's a he understands the Constitution. That's not necessarily so with Donald Trump. Um, they're just that he doesn't arouse the same concerns. And if and so you know, I'm not sure whether the uh, the Jews, the Republican Jews who are now backing Cruz, who wouldn't do it so before, genuinely want him to win. If they're converting themselves to that idea or if they just want him to just stop Trump. I think David Frum, who is, a, who is Jewish, who is a speechwriter for George W. Bush, he had a very funny uh, thing on Twitter the other day where he said something like, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I, I don't have it in front of me, uh, yeah, sure, the, if the choice is between Donald Trump and the complete destruction of the Republican Party and Ted Cruz and a 53-47 win for Hillary Clinton, we're going to go with, uh, Ted Cruz All right. 347 All right. for Hillary Clinton. By the way, there is so much more I want to talk to you about. I will have to call you again. We'll continue the conversation. You are always so lovely to talk to, and you bring insight that is so important for the JBS audience and the Jewish community here. I thank you all. Of, all of, It's a pleasure to have you. I, I continue to thank you for making time for us. I will call you again very shortly. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Be well. The thoughts of Ron Campius, the Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA. Um, again, it's a fun time if you're a political junkie. At the same time, it is a remarkable, uh, it, it is a remarkably complex and in some way confusing political time as we watch both the Democrat and the Republican primaries. My thanks as always to Sloan Copeland, our director, Serge Goldberg, our production coordinator, to the associate director of JBS, Dara Golub, and to the producers of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal and Jan Weiss. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.